like to turn it over to Pastor Troy. Good morning, everybody. You guys look good today. I'm glad you're here. This is a uh, this is an interesting day. We are we've been in the book of Hebrews, uh, going through it. You know, going through the entire book, which we don't do a whole lot, but we do do it some. We do it sometimes, uh, and um, there's good things and bad things about going through an entire book. Uh, the good thing is that you get the. By the time you're done, you've gone through an entire book of the Bible and you know a lot about it. Uh, the bad thing is that there's certain parts that you have to preach about that you wish you didn't have to preach about. And uh, today is one of those days. So let me just say, this past week has been has been difficult. Uh, just trying to figure out. Well, I, I, God, how do I preach this in a way that doesn't sound this way? Or how do I preach it in a way that people can understand it? Um, so as we come today, I just want to let you know, um, this is going to be kind of a serious day, right? Uh, so it's going to be, we're kind of going to go um, talk about a lot, a, a topic that is difficult. Um, so look to the person next to you and go, are you ready? Did they say yes? <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> Maybe you should ask me if I'm ready. I don't know if I'm ready today. Yeah, we're, we'll see. So we're going to see what God does. Um, we're going to, I mean, honestly, so here's the thing. We believe everything that's in God's word is right and true. And so there are parts that, are, um, that we love to hear about, you know, that God loved the world, that he gave his only son. You know, you know we know these great verses, and we hang, we hang our hopes and dreams on those verses, you know, that God has, a, God has a plan for your life. All these things that we think, these are great verses. But then there's the verses that are a little more difficult. So as we talk about Hebrews, Hebrews, the author of Hebrews really focuses on discovering the supremacy of Christ. So who Jesus is um, in a little different way than the other books explain who Jesus is. So this looks at Jesus theologically and looks at who he is as God, as the creator of the world, as the one who gave his life for our lives. And as we look at that, the author goes into some very interesting territory. So last week we talked about moving from drinking milk to eating meat right, from being a spiritual baby to becoming a spiritual, spiritually mature adult. So today, since you've already mastered that this week, right, since we got that out of the way th last week, now we're moving on to maturity this week so we can talk about this verse, right? You guys ready? Here we go. So Hebrews is full of warnings and encouragement, and today is honestly, this is one of the most difficult passages in the entire Bible. Um, it's a passage that people love to not preach on. All right. It's a passage that people love to overlook. It's a passage that when you are younger and you like talking about spiritual things, this often comes up um, as one of those things that's a difficult thing. And you go, I don't know what I believe about this. Um, some people believe this and some people believe this. So we're going to lay it all out there. We're going to kind of go through it and then you can make up your own decision at the end. But hopefully the Holy Spirit will guide you to what is the truth. So as we start, here's the question that we're looking at today. Can you lose your salvation? Sometimes you'll hear this talked about in terms of um, once saved, always saved. Or sometimes you hear about it as the perseverance of the saints. You'll, you'll hear it talked about in these certain ways, which I'm not sure give great, uh, great feedback or great description of what this really means. And sometimes we get the wrong idea. Can you lose your salvation? What that means is once you come to know Christ, once you've accepted him into your life, once you have surrendered your will to his, can you at some point... Do something bad enough or ignore God long enough that God says you are no longer part of the body of believers. So can you actually lose your salvation? And then if you can lose it, can you get it back again? You know, is it kind of like a hotel that you check into and out of, right? You check into the hotel, you're saved. You check out of the hotel, you're not saved. You check in again, you're saved. You check out again, you're not saved, right? Like, can't, is this the way that God works? It's a really great question because growing up, I was petrified of this kind of theology because for me, I was trying to figure out, am I really a Christian? Have I really been saved? I know some people that seem better than me and do better things than me, and I know some people who do worse things than me, so where do I fall in the middle? And I was always trying to find out, where's the cutoff line, you know? How do I make sure that I'm above this line and not below this line, right? Because I want to make sure that when... Jesus comes back again, or when I breathe my last breath, that I'm going to enter into heaven, that I'm going to spend my eternity with Christ. And so I used to struggle with this a lot. This is a great question. Can you lose your salvation? And the key verses we're looking at today are in Hebrews 6. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Hebrews 6. Um, the notes should be on your version event. 
Um, so if you want to go to you version, you can go ahead and open that up. All the scriptures are in there. Um, and uh, I'll just say for all the life groups that are working on, you know, that are going, that are basing their life groups on the topics of the sermons, good luck this week, all right? Just have, a, have fun with it, right? So here's what we go. Here, let's just start. We'll just get into it. Starting with verse 4 from chapter 6. It is what? We can do better than that. It is what? It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have what? Fallen away. It is impossible to be brought, to be what? What's that say? Brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God over, uh, all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. So as we look at this passage, this is the core passage. This is the one that people struggle with. What does it mean to fall away? And then not even that you've fallen away, but then you've been, it's, it's impossible to be brought back to repentance. So let's just kind of look at this a little bit differently. It is impossible for those, so who's he talking about? What kind of people are, is he talking about right here? He's talking about people who have been enlightened, right, by God, in some spiritually, spiritual enlightenment of some sort, who have tasted the heavenly gift. They understand Jesus' gift of salvation to us. They have shared in the Holy Spirit. They've tasted the goodness of the word of God, so they love God's word and they read God's word. And, and they've also tasted of the powers of the coming age. So as you think about this, you go, well, okay, so that's who we're talking about. And then we're talking about these people have fallen away. The people we just described have fallen away. People who have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God. They have fallen away. And then it gets to the hard part, right? Because we all know that this is like a parenthesis here. All those things in that list are a parenthesis. So if you want to see what it's really saying, you take out the stuff in the parenthesis and just read it, right? And it says, it is impossible for those to be brought back to repentance, right? It's impossible for those who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. So here's the thing. You know that when you sin, if you are a Christian, that you need to repent for that sin. So you sin, and then you get down on your knees and say, Father, forgive me. Right, forgive me my sins. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross and, and dying for that sin that just happened in my life. And this is the constant cycle for any Christian, right? That you try to live your life in a way that pleases God, but then at some point you sin, and so you ask God for forgiveness. But what this verse is saying is that if you've, even if you've been, had all these things happen in your life, and you have fallen away, it's impossible for those who have experienced those things and who have fallen away be back to be brought back to repentance that seems pretty intense doesn't it it means that there's a point it seems like what it's saying is there's a point of no return that in your spiritual life there's a point that you can cross that you cannot get back from you can go too far it seems like what it's saying and so i think one of the big questions is you say well who is this actually referring to and you think if you look at that list You'd say, well, it sounds like that it's referring to believers. These are people who are part of the church. These are people who have been saved. These are people who have surrendered their lives to Christ. These are people of God. It certainly sounds like that, doesn't it? And yet they've fallen away, and it's impossible for them to come back to repentance because they've fallen away. So as we look at this, I think a couple questions that we need to ask ourselves are this. The first thing is, who are these people? And what is their spiritual life truly like? Because it certainly gives us the idea that they're church-going, God-believing, God-fearing people who have fallen away, and now it's impossible for them to get back. But here's the interesting thing. Jesus calls out some of these people in the church, and Jesus tells us that there are people who go to church and who believe in Jesus and who have maybe come down to the altar and given their lives to Christ and have done all these things but he says that they're still not authentic Christians. That in, in, in the depths of who they are, they've never truly surrendered their will to Christ. In Matthew chapter 7, here's what Jesus says. Many will say to me on that day, it's talking about the very last day of the world, Jesus comes back, and in, in Matthew 7, Jesus says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? 
and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And Jesus says, then I will tell them plainly. What's he say? Yeah, you don't even want to say it, do you? you don't want, I know there's some of you back here like, I'm not saying that, right? Jesus says what? He says what? I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Who are the evildoers? They're people who are prophesying in Jesus' name. They're people who are driving out demons in Jesus' name. They're people who are performing miracles in Jesus' name. And Jesus says to them, I never knew you. This is the Jesus that we serve. This is the Jesus that we worship. This is the Jesus who established the church that we worship in right here. This is the Jesus that Protestants and Catholics around the world are all worshiping today. This is Jesus Christ looking at people who seemingly were his people and saying, I never knew you. This is frightening to me because I'm one of these people that are part of this church, right? And I think when I stand on the last day and I stand in front of Jesus who's seated on his throne, what's going to happen to me? If there are people who have done all these amazing things, they've been enlightened by his word, they've seen the power of God, they've, they've prophesied, they've driven out demons, they've done miracles, and some of these people will end up not being a part of God's kingdom in the future. To me, that's terrifying. Because I go, what does that really mean? I mean, these people seemed like godly spiritual people, but in reality, they never actually knew Christ. Now, in the Bible, there's another verse, another passage, I think it's Matthew either 24 or 25, where Jesus talks about that at the end of all days, that all the people will stand before him. And it says that Jesus will separate the people like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And the goats will go off into everlasting punishment, and the sheep will go into everlasting life. I told you this was going to be heavy today, didn't I, right? I mean, I'm sorry about this, but this, these, this is what Jesus says. This is what the, the leader of our faith says. And so what that means is, is all the people gather, even people in the church, that some people are going to go on to eternal life and some people are not. Other places Jesus says, there's a narrow road and few find it, but wide is the road that leads to destruction and many are on it. I mean, these are, these are divisive words. These words are all telling us in these teachings that there are some people who will enter into eternity with Jesus and other people will enter in eternity without Jesus. And this is hard, hard stuff. So the real question is this. Can an authentic Christian fall away from the faith? I think that's where we want to land today. Because we obviously know that there are some people who say they believe in Jesus that really don't. And if you really could see their hearts, you'd know their hearts are not with God. There's other people who say they believe in Jesus, and they actually do. They've given their life to service to Christ. You can tell by the way they talk. You can tell by the, the way they serve. You can tell by the way they love. They, you can tell by who they are that they're people that God has changed their heart. But there's other people who are kind of like infiltrated among us, right? Don't look around, don't, right? They're, they're here somewhere, right? But, but that, that have not authentically surrendered their lives to Christ. And that's kind of a scary thought. So there are lots of verses that give us some perspective on this. So we're going to go through a bunch of verses that talk about authentic Christians and the relationship that they have with Jesus. Because this is where I want you, if you truly have surrendered your life to Jesus, these verses should all bring you some comfort. So here's from all different kinds of writers in the Bible. It's just not one writer we're looking at. All different kinds of um, writers in the Bible. So we're just going to go through a bunch of verses right now. Um, you can always go back and look at them later on your, you know, in your notes if you want. But we're just going to kind of go through them so you can understand how much God loves us and how much he cares about us. So the first one is this. It's from John. John was one of Jesus' closest um, confidants. He was in Jesus' inner circle. If Jesus had two or three best friends, John would have been one of them. And here's what he wrote. And this is the will of him who sent me, this is Jesus talking, that I shall, what? Lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have what? Eternal life. And that will raise them up at the last day. This passage seems to say none of, anybody who's truly been saved, will, none of them will be lost. 
that Jesus will lose none of them and that they shall have eternal life because he will raise us up on the last day. Let's look to another passage. This is from Romans. So this is Paul. Paul was a guy who was vehemently against Jesus and against Christianity, persecuting the church, throwing Christians into jail. Jesus changed his life, and he became one of the biggest proponents for the Christian church in the history of the world. So this is Paul writing this. He says this, For I am convinced that neither life, or no, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to what? Yeah, separated from what? The love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. That should be good news, right? It is good news. Uh, let's look at the next one. First Corinthians. This is Paul writing to the church of Corinth, and here's what he says. He, this is, will, God, will also keep you what? Firm to the end. So that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is faithful. So God is faithful. He will keep you firm to the end. Who are those? Who, who is who? Or you? You is anybody who's accepted Jesus and his sacrifice and laid down your life for him and said, God, you take charge of my life. He will keep you firm to the end. Let's look at another one. Uh, this is from Philippians. This is, again, Paul writing to the church of Philippi. And he says, he who began a good work in you... So he who saved you, he who started something in your life, he who awakened your spiritual life, will carry it on to what? Completion. Until the day of Christ Jesus. He will finish it. He's not just going to let you go. He's going to finish it. He's going to keep you to completion. So again, it's one of, these, one of these verses that say, once you have surrendered your life to Jesus in an authentic way, that he's going to keep you to the end. Let's look at another one. This is First Peter. This is Peter. Again, Peter is one of Jesus' closest friends, too. Peter, James, and John were super close to Jesus. Peter actually denied Jesus. Oh, all right. There's interesting, right? Did he fall away? Because Peter was one of Jesus' best friends, yet when Jesus was standing before Pilate, just about to be crucified, Peter denied Jesus three times. I don't even know the man. And he gets really mad. He, he, completely, he completely denies Christ three times, yet Peter will be with us on the last day. You see why this is a difficult topic, right? It's confusing. All right, 1 Peter, here's what Peter writes. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never what? Right, he's given you an inheritance that will never perish spoil, or fade. Never. It won't. He's given you an inheritance that cannot be taken away. So these verses all give us these things to think about, right? Here's John. Let's just, just one more. This is John quoting Jesus. John, again, was one of Jesus' best friends. Um, Jesus is, he's quoting Jesus. Jesus says this, I give them what? Eternal life, and they shall what? Never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. No one will snatch them out of my hand. You know, with this idea of Christ holding us in his hands, uh, in 1987, there was a flight 255, I believe, coming out of Detroit. It went up. It, it took off from the, um, it took off of the, uh, what is that thing called? <laughs> what did it take off of? The tarmac? All right, whatever it is. It took off, all right? It took off. Something horrible happened with the flaps of the plane, and moments after it took off, it crashed into a highway um, just a little bit down the road. 155 people were killed. One survivor. There's only one survivor. It was a four-year-old girl named Cecilia. And emergency workers, when they found her, I mean, everybody was gone. The wreckage was unbelievable. And yet they heard a small cry, and they found Cecilia. And emergency workers report that the reason she survived is because her mother, when the plane started to go down, wrapped her arms around this girl. And I just think, gosh, man, like you think about, Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. It's almost like Jesus just takes you into his arms and holds you and he is the one that takes you and carries you the entire way. No one's going to snatch you out of Jesus' arms. These are, these are encouraging words for us as believers 
um, because it just says we will never be taken out of the Father's hand, that he has us and he holds us tight, and he will keep us to the very end. So can you lose your salvation? Here's what I think. I think you can lose your salvation if it wasn't real from the start. I think that if you had an authentic profession of faith, and Jesus has really transformed your life, and there is good things showing from your life because of that, I think that maybe you didn't ever have a truly authentic profession. And if you fall away, I think it's possible that you never were fully in his kingdom. That's kind of my thought. Now, there are different trains of thought on this. Um, People believe different things about this. But I think that as you look at Scripture, it is so heavy on the verses that we just read about you never losing, about you always being within God's plan, about nobody can snatch you out of God's hands. I just don't see how you can reconcile that with you can completely fall away to the point of never returning if you're truly an authentic Christian. So I think that the writer of Hebrews may be saying, these people all look like they belong to us, but there's something in their heart that never truly was. So how do you know if your, if your profession was real? How do you know if you actually had an authentic profession of faith or if it's not true? How do you know if you're a true believer or if you're an imposter? I mean, how do you actually know that? What's the guarantee? What's the telltale sign? Well, the writer actually goes into this next, and he actually talks about this a little bit. So what he says is in verses um, 7 and 8 of chapter 6, he says this. He talks about this, gives us the illustration about the land. And the land is really us. It's our hearts. It says the land that what? Drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful for those for whom it is farmed. If you're that kind of land that produces a crop and drinks in the rain, it says you receive what? The blessings of God. So that's it's, so the writer's kind of saying, so here's maybe how you can tell who's an authentic Christian from who's not an authentic Christian. One is the kind of land you are. If you're the kind of land that drinks in the rain and produces blessings of God, and you receive blessings of God because you've, been, you've produced a good crop, then you, would say, are an authentic Christian. But then it goes on to give the other side of the coin, which is the land that produces what? Thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of what? Yeah, being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. So the, the illustration is kind of like this. Let me put it in kind of a, um, a graphic here so you can see it a little bit. So we have the rain, right? And God's rain, right, God, the, the things of God come down and they land on really everybody, whether you're a believer or not, right? So the, as the rain comes down, it's going to land on a cultivated heart or an uncultivated heart. And a cultivated heart is one that's been plowed. It's been, it probably has, um, you know, it's been treated in a certain way that it's ready to receive seeds so that things can grow in it. It's good land. It's fertile. It's ready for things to grow in it. Then you have an uncultivated heart, which is land that nothing has really been done to. It's not been plowed. It's probably hard. It may be full of clay. It may not be ready to receive what God is pouring down on it. So rain just runs off. It's kind of like the summer, right? We didn't get rain forever. And when it finally rains... The ground is so hard, it doesn't soak it up. It just runs right off of it. So the rain from God falls on two different kinds of land. And each of us has either a cultivated heart that's ready to receive what God gives us, or we have an uncultivated heart, which really doesn't listen to God at all. And then it says from there that the cultivated heart is going to produce fruit, and the uncultivated heart is going to produce thorns. And then the final thing is that the cultivated heart will eventually you will receive blessings because of what you do and who you are. And the uncultivated heart, because of the thorns, is going to receive cursing. And in the end, it will be burned. So people in the church can have, actually have spiritual experiences. People in the church um, can have spiritual experiences. They can read their Bible. They can pray. They can attend church faithfully. But in the end, their heart was never truly cultivated. It was all just stuff they were doing. There was no actual relationship with Jesus. And I think that's the difference. So this part, to me, when I read these verses, they make me very uncomfortable. Because I start to take an inventory of who I am and say, God, do I truly have a relationship with Jesus? 
am I a cultivated heart or am I an uncultivated heart? Where, do I, where, where am I? And I think for all of us, we need to take that inventory and say, God, where, do, where is my heart? Is it cultivated or is it uncultivated? And I think we all want to, want to be where God wants us to be. But I think a big part of this is, are you willing to surrender your will to God's will? Are you willing to let him drive your car? Are you willing to give him, the, you know, hand a steering wheel to God and say, you drive it, I'm just, I'm just going to go where you tell me to go? Or are you the kind of person that says, no, I'm in control of my life. I'm going to do what I want to do. And, you know, God, you can drive with me. You can sit in passenger seat, but I'm never giving the driver's wheel to you. And I think those are uncultivated hearts where God never actually gets the driver's seat. These are people who you never hear say, I really felt like God was moving me in this direction. Why do they say that? Because they're moving their own direction. God's not a part of the equation. When people hit a wall, they either look to God or they look to themselves or they look to other self-help things in this world. It's a, it's, a, it's a big factor of where your heart is. So after the author of Hebrews scares the snot out of these people, right, just saying, none of you may be saved, right? He goes through all this thing, right? Then he, then he ends up encouraging them. So in the next verses that we look at, just in the, in the same passage, chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, the writer says this, even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of what? Better things in your case. So they, he scares them to death, and he says, but in your case, we hope for better things for you, right? He says, the things that, that have to do with, the sal- with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have what? Help his people and continue to what? Help them. So one thing the author is saying is, God sees your work. God sees what you do for him. God sees, and he, and he kind of focuses in on this one particular thing. He sees if you have helped his people. So I think one question to ask yourself is to say, am I somebody who helps God's people? Or am I somebody who actually hinders God's people? And when you look at the people in the church, you go, you go okay, so people in the church who help God's people are ones that have had a true profession of faith. They love the body of Christ. They love the church. They're not going to do anything to tear it down. They're not going to talk negatively about the church or about what happens in the church. They're going to support it. They're going to ra- be raised up as leaders. They're not going to be those who are drinking milk their entire life, right, and just soaking it in. But they're going to say, I want meat. I want, I, I want to serve. I didn't, I didn't, I'm not coming to this church so I can just soak it in and sit in the chair and say, what can this church give to me? Can this church give me a small group? Can this church give me good Bible teaching? Can this church give me good music? What can this church do for me? Can it take care of my kids? And you're just like, what does this church do for me? And you're just going to sit there and soak it in. People who want meat say, I'm not here to be served. I'm here to serve. Right? Because the author's saying, the one characteristic that he knows about where somebody's cultivated heart is, is if they've helped his people and continue to help them. So I think one question to ask yourself is, am I helping the body of Christ? Or am I just here to take from it? Just to squeeze the life out of this, just to get as much as I can. And then when this church stops meeting my needs, I'm, I'm to the next one. Because this church isn't meeting my needs. I love this quote from JFK, right? And it's, and it's, it's stuck with me, and, and most people know this quote because it's very famous, right? JFK says, ask not what your country can do for you, right? But ask what you can what? Right. So ask not what your church can do for you, but ask what? Yeah. This is a key characteristic of someone who has their heart in the right spot. They want to serve. They want to help people. They want to do as much as they can to move the kingdom of God forward and watch lives be transformed. That's that's where, where the true heart is. So I think that you kind of look at this and go, okay, so where am I? I'm, am I somebody who's trying to help the church? Or do I do things that actually pull the church down and hinder the church? Am I here to, do, do, I, do I pray for the, the team leads of this church, that their ministries will be fruitful? Do I pray for the people who are engaged in volunteer activities? Do I participate in those activities? Am I here to build up the church? Or am I here just to be a participant? Am I just glad there's a chair there that's empty that I can sit in? These are key things that the author's looking to, saying, where is your heart? Where's your heart? 
And, but then he encourages these people to, to press on. So the next couple of verses, he says this. We want each of you to show this, this same what? People who may be in the church that aren't really believers. Um, but, I, but I think that, you know, here's the thing. I see that your work is doing things for Jesus. I see that you're helping God's people. And I want you to continue being diligent. So he knows they're diligent. I think the question is to ask ourselves and for me to ask myself, am I being diligent? I mean, diligent says that you are working at it actively. You're being diligent every day. God, how can you change my heart? God, what is this passage of scripture saying to me? God, how can I help my neighbors? God, how, how can I serve in the church? How can I serve your people? Who's in need? How can I help other people around me? That's being diligent. You're constantly pursuing this relationship with Jesus and helping the people of God. We want each of you to show the same diligence to what? To the what? To the very end. So keep doing it. Don't stop so that what you hope for may be fully realized. Verse 12. We do not want you to become what? Lazy. But to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Wow, I think the question is this, right? What kind of land are you? Are you cultivated land? Are you uncultivated land? Is your life producing fruit? Or is your life producing thorns? Are you receiving the blessings of God? Or do you feel like you're receiving curses? Where does your heart land? Are you producing fruit? I think it's a huge thing, especially when the author drills down on this one idea of helping those in the church that need help. Helping those that are part of the body of Christ. Helping the body of Christ to thrive. Are you there? Peter says the same thing. Again, Peter's one of Jesus' closest friends. In Peter's book, he writes this. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to what? Yeah. And Jesus said this. When people ask, when they're wondering about what's the deal with Jesus. Jesus, why did you come here? What is your purpose? Jesus said this. I didn't come to serve. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. Back up. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, right? Even though he's, he's the king of kings, right? Jesus should be the one who comes and says, hey, I'm the king of the world. I can, you deserve whatever I give you, and you should be serving me, right? He says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. And not only to serve, but to become a sacrifice, to become a sacrifice for everybody. So Jesus' entire mission was to come and not receive but to come and give. And we're supposed to be, as Paul says, imitators of Christ. But we live in a selfish, selfish culture. And we are most of the time looking out for number one, which is us, number two, our family, and anybody else, maybe if we have time, we're busy people. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. Peter says, you should, whatever gifts God has given you, whatever gift he's given you, and we all have different gifts. You have different gifts than I do, but whatever gift we have, we're supposed to be using it to serve others. Not ourselves, to serve others. Is your mind constantly focused on yourself? Oh, I feel bad. Somebody said this to me. I feel bad. Some, you know, I just, I'm just, what's happening with my life? I'm thinking about all these things I'm involved with. What am I supposed to do? What am I, I mean, if you're constantly focused on yourself, then that would make you a selfish person. Just think about yourself all the time. For those people where your mind has been changed, right, as Paul says, by the renewing of your mind, you've renewed your mind, and now you start thinking about the people around you. How can I help the people around me? I see people in pain. I see people who are hurting. I need to reach out. I need to make a phone call. I need to make a meal. I need to visit somebody. I need to, do, I, I need to reach out to people around me because people are hurting everywhere. My job, according to Scripture and according to Jesus, is to serve other people, to help other people. Is my mind on other people and how I can help them? Or is my mind on how other people can feed into my life and I can just soak it up? Is your land cultivated or is it uncultivated? It's a big question. Here's, the, here's what I encourage you to do. Drink in the rain. Just because you're uncultivated now does not mean you can't be cultivated. It can start today. 
you can start drinking in the rain. You know this, if the rain falls long enough on hard ground, it will eventually soften. Man, some of us have some of this tough exterior. Our hearts, as the author was saying, right, several weeks ago we talked about the author saying, don't harden your hearts like the people of Israel. Some of those people in Israel, their hearts were so hard that they never really came into a relationship with God because their hearts were hard. Don't let your heart become hardened. Drink in the rain. Drink in the rain. Because going back to this verse, right, in, in verses 7 and 8, land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful for those whom it is fr- farmed, receives the blessing of God. And the opposite, right? But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. What's the point, right? The point is this. Start producing fruit. Drink in the rain. Allow your heart to become softened. Allow your life to be softened. Allow God to start doing things in your life. Allow yourself to be submitted to God's will and looking around you with God's eyes and saying, God, what do you want me to do? How can I help other people? Not just, God, what can you do for me? I think it's the key difference between somebody who has an authentic heart change with Jesus and somebody who doesn't. Somebody who does has sacrificed their own life. My life doesn't matter anymore, God. I'm trying to help other people and I'm in any way, shape I can. But my life doesn't matter anymore. It's called laying down your life. When Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me, he's not saying, this is going to be the best thing ever in the world. He's going, yeah, there's a cross over there and it's going to hurt and it's heavy, but I need you to go pick it up. And I need you to drag it to the end of the world. And you're like, okay. God, you gave your life for me. I'm going to give my life for you. If you want me to go pick up that cross and endure hardship and pain and awful things for you, I will do it because my life, it's not about my life anymore. And I think too many of us, it's all about our life. I think we need to get back on track and say, being a Christian is not about me. Being a Christian is about everyone else. It's Jesus first, others are second, and I'm last. Jesus put himself in the back seat all the time. And he put others' needs in in, in front of his. I think it's a key, key difference. Start producing fruit. Drink in the rain. So where do you go from here? Here's some next steps you can do. First one is this. You can start serving. Start serving. Just open your eyes and say, God, how can I serve those around me? I will guarantee you this. If you say to God, if you get some quiet time, you spend some time with God this week, and you just say, God, how can I start serving the people around me? You are not just going to get a blank in your mind. You won't. God will give you something to do. He will give you a task. He will give you somebody's name or somebody's face. He will give you something that you can do to serve him. He will, because you're asking for it. You're actually asking, how can I serve somebody around me? And that's what God wants to use, a cultivated heart, a heart that says, God, I'm ready. I'm ready to be used. I'm cultivated What do you want me to do? God will answer that prayer. So start serving and ask God, who do you want me to serve? And he will give you a name. I'd say dig deeper in the knowledge of God. One way is we're having this uh, seminar after church. You can say, I just want to know more deep. I want to know at a deeper level what God's relationship is with his people. Going through these covenants for Let's Make a Deal will help you understand how God works in this world a little bit better. Third thing is you can do this. You can memorize 1 Peter 4.10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. And then start serving others. It's a key difference. It's a cultivated heart. The last one is this. Start putting others first. Start putting others first. Look for others' needs and put them before your own. Maybe you have something that you could give to somebody that would make their life blessed. Maybe you can go without it. Maybe God wants you to sacrifice something. Maybe you have something that could be of help to somebody else. Sacrifice it. Say, God, I know that I have this, and I know that I could use it, and I know that I would love it but this person might love it too. I'm going to give it away because I'm sacrificing that for you. I want a cultivated heart. I'm going to drink in the rain. I'm going to drink in all that God pours into my life and I'm going to pour it out for other people. Is this the easy way? No, it's not the easy way. Is this the fun way? Well, sometimes it's fun, right? Once you, once you see somebody else's life blessed because you've done something for them, you do feel good about yourself because you've done what God called you to do. But is it like fun, like you're enjoying all the things that you have? No, not really. You're living a life saying, my life is a sacrifice for other people. I want to sacrifice for everybody else because that's what God calls us to do. So it is difficult. It's an uphill climb. Faith, getting your faith to the finish line is difficult. 
And I know that from some, some messages and stuff that you listen to, it's like if you're, if you're a Christian, you should be blessed and happy and everything should be good, and that's just not biblical. Those people have not read the whole Bible, and if they have read the whole Bible, they're cutting out parts that sound bad, and they're keeping the parts that sound good. Being a Christian is a difficult life, and it's hard because you are now focused on how your life can help other people and not just what you can get. This is not a popular message. This is a message that, to be honest with you, I would not have said, gosh, I'll preach about anything in the Bible. What should I preach about today? Preach about this, <laughs> right? Because it's not popular. And so, but here's the thing. My job is not to make us a popular church. My, God is not, my job is not to just, you know, only preach one side of the Bible. It's to preach everything. Do I struggle with this? Absolutely, I struggle with this. But I want you to struggle with it too. Because I believe that everything that God tells us is the stuff that he wants us to soak in because he wants to make us into better people. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. And we are all in this process of being completed. And some of us are more done than others, right? But none of us will reach that point until we take our last breath and we are with Jesus, which he turns us into perfection at that point. But until then, we are on a process of being chiseled and formed into what God wants us to be. Let's give you another great il illustration, right? Clay. Is your, is your heart hard as clay that God can't even mold it? Or is your heart moldable? Can God form you because you're allowing your heart to be soft? Are you land that is cultivated or are you hard land that is uncultivated? It's a great thing to think about. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this um, day. We thank you, Lord, for this word, even though it is a difficult word. God, we ask that you would take your word and, and embed it into our hearts. Teach us what you want to teach us from it. Lord, continue to stretch us and grow us into the people that you want us to be. And God, may we serve you by serving those around us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And all God's people said, amen. All right.